what is religion? Is it a natural human phenomenon? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Should we be religious today? Or is being religious a sign of ignorance and immaturity? Is it important for us to learn about religion, regardless of whether or not we're religious? Is there a difference between religion and spirituality? These are just a few of the questions that come up when we start thinking about religion. And in this video, we're only going to focus on one. What is religion? Before we explore existing definitions of religion, let's consider a broader question. How do we even go about defining something like religion? When defining things, some philosophers like to focus on the necessary and sufficient qualities of that thing. So for instance, I might say that being wood is a necessary quality of a living tree. By saying this, I'm saying that if something isn't wood, it can't be a living tree. But being wood isn't a sufficient condition to be a living tree. There are lots of things that are made of wood that aren't living trees, like tables and chairs. So the question becomes, what is the sufficient collection of necessary conditions in order to make something what it is? Once you know that, you know what a thing is. But if we apply this method to defining something like religion, we're going to find out that it's really difficult to do. The English-American theologian Paul Griffiths wrote that if you try to discover what religion actually is, you'll quickly reach the conclusion that hardly anyone has any idea what they are talking about. Or perhaps more accurately, that there are so many different ideas in play about what religion is that conversations in which the term figures significantly make the difficulties in communication at the Tower of Babel seem minor and easily dealt with. What are you going to do, Paul? Some words are just difficult to define. Think of the word game, for example. What are the necessary and sufficient conditions of a game? You might define a game as a competition between two people or groups. But not all such competitions are games. War, for example, is a competition between two groups. But it's hardly a game. So you might amend your definition to say a competition between two people or groups that's supposed to be enjoyable for those involved. This seems better, but then again, not all games have to be between two people. Consider the game Solitaire. It's a card game that you have to play by yourself. Some single player video games are like this as well. And really, thank goodness there are games like this. Otherwise, Carl, who no one wants to play with, wouldn't be able to play any games. These games are all he has. Right now, there is a Carl alone with nobody to play games with. A small donation from you can help this car have a better life. A life with meaning, purpose, community. Don't hesitate. Call now. Donate. Make a difference. That's for you, Carl. That's for you. So maybe games don't have to be competitive with other people, but maybe they at least have to have a goal. So then we can at least compete with ourselves. Can I complete Hollow Knight faster than I did last time? Why am I playing Hollow Knight again? It's such a difficult game. My god, I'm so angry at Hollow Knight. Get down! Seriously though, Hollow Knight's kind of a cool game. You should try it. Anyway, we could amend our definition to be an activity you do by yourself with a goal that's meant to be enjoyable. Wait, an activity you do by yourself with a goal that's meant to be enjoyable? That doesn't sound right. I think there's some activities that fall into this category that aren't games. Why are you blushing, Carl? Why are you blushing? Also, some games don't actually have goals. Take a game like Roblox, where you just play to create. There's no specific goal in mind, you just create things. Now there is another way to think about defining words. The Australian-British philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein said that language doesn't actually refer to things as they are in themselves. Instead, language simply functions as a way of communicating with one another. In this sense, it doesn't really matter if I can define the word game according to its necessary and sufficient qualities. What matters is that when I say, I'd like to play a game, you know what I mean. Oh, and you know what I mean, Carl. And generally speaking, that works. We may have difficulty defining the word game, but we don't have as much difficulty identifying games. For instance, if I give you the following list. Drowning. Dungeons and Dragons. Torturing Turtles. Sleeping. Baseball. Demonic Worship. Candyland. Hiking. Most people will probably agree that Dungeons and Dragons, Baseball, and Candyland are games. But Drowning, Torturing Turtles, Demonic Worship, Sleeping, and Hiking aren't games. No, Carl, I don't think a competition to see who could drown the most turtles to garner the favor of a demon overlord would be a fun game. You're sick. That's what you are. Sick. So even if we can't identify the necessary and sufficient qualities of a game, the word still functions in a way that we can use it in conversation and we know what each other means. And that's the important function of language. And that's Wittgenstein's point, that we know how each other is using the word, not what the word means in and of itself. 
Given these considerations, how might we talk about the word religion? Well, on the one hand, we can try to figure out the necessary and sufficient qualities of religion and go that way, provide a universal and definitive definition of religion. And some people have gone that route. Here's a few different options. The German theologian and philosopher Friedrich Schleiermacher said, the essence of religion consists in the feeling of absolute dependence. The French sociologist Emile Durkheim said that religion is a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things, that is to say, things set apart and forbidden. The German philosopher and theologian Rudolf Otto said, religion is that which grows out of and gives expression to experience of the holy in its various aspects. The American philosopher and psychologist John Dewey said, the religion just as any activity pursued on behalf of an ideal end against obstacles and in spite of threats of personal loss because of its general and enduring value. The German-American theologian Paul Tillich said, religion is the state of being grasped by an ultimate concern, a concern which qualifies all other concerns as preliminary and which itself contains the answer to the question of the meaning of life. The religious scholar and historian James Livingston said, religion is that system of activities and beliefs directed toward that which is perceived to be of sacred value and trans forming power. The English philosopher John Hick wrote, religion constitutes our varied human response to transcendent reality. And finally, just for fun, the English writer and philosopher Aldous Huxley wrote, religion is the price we pay for being intelligent, but not as yet intelligent enough. Many of these definitions tend toward establishing an essence of religion, a set of necessary and sufficient qualities that says what a religion is what all religions are. That is, religions necessarily require a feeling of absolute dependence, a reference to things that are sacred, something transcendent, forbidden, or holy, and so on. It seems to me that this is a dangerous way to go about defining religion. It tries to fit everything into a neat category, but it doesn't do justice to the immense variety of cultural expressions and spiritual practices we see around the world. So it might be better to take a different approach. Another approach we might take is to look at how the word religion functions in our cultural conversations today. How are we using the word? If you take a class in world religions in the United States, you'll probably run into the following religions. Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Zoroastrianism, Confucianism, Jainism, Shintoism, Sikhism, and Taoism. Even though, of course, some of these can be viewed more as philosophies than as religions, depending on how you're using the term. You may also encounter discussions on indigenous and ancient religions. This suggests that the word religion functions in such a way, either in our particular social setting or at least in academic discussions, that it includes these various cultural expressions. In other words, if I gave a relatively well-informed person the following list, Hinduism, racism, Judaism, parkour, Islam, Buddhism, fishing, and ask them to choose which ones were religions, most people would likely choose the same ones. No, Carl, I don't care how much fishing is an ultimate concern for you. It's not a religion. Let it go. Given how the word religion tends to function in our society, we can then ask if there are some common tendencies among the different things we tend to label as religions. However, the point isn't to provide an absolute definition of religion, it's to think about how the word religion functions and to look at common tendencies within that function. We're just asking how we use the word in our particular setting. So how do we use the word? What do these different expressions have in common? Well, we might say that religions tend to have creeds, belief systems that provide a fuller picture of the way that the world is, that give followers of that religion special insight into the world. Consider the following. Hinduism teaches that we're all trapped in the cycle of samsara the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. Buddhism teaches the Four Noble Truths about suffering. One, that we all suffer. Two, that suffering is caused by attachment and desire. Three, that we can end suffering if we end our attachment and desire. And four, the way to end our attachment and desire is to follow the Eightfold Path. In Judaism, you have a statement of faith known as the Shema. It states that the Lord God is one and that you should love the Lord God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Christianity has a number of creeds, one of the most famous being the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed declares God the Father, the creator of all things. It also declares Jesus, God the Son. It also declares that the Spirit is God. Islam also has a profession of faith called the Shahada. Is it Shahada or Shahada? I don't know. It goes like this. There is no God but God, and Muhammad is the messenger of God. Muslims also emphasize the absolute oneness of God, known as Tawhid. This idea goes against the notion we find in Christianity that God is Trinity. Zoroastrianism may be one of the oldest known monotheistic religions. It maintains that there is only one God, Ahura Mazda, who is at war with an evil being, Angra Mainyu. I feel like I'm mispronouncing 
all of these words, like a Mr. Garvey calling Roll in that Keenan and Peele skit. Confucianism doesn't really have beliefs about gods or spirits. However, there is a belief that humanity ought to seek peace by pursuing a great unity in the world. Closely connected to Hinduism, Jainism believes that the path to escaping samsara is achieved through living at peace with all living creatures. According to Shintoism, everything in the world is inhabited by kami, a word loosely translated as gods or spirits. Sikhism believes in the one god, Waheguru, who is described in the Mul Mantar. Is there a Wehi Guru present here? Wehi Guru? Mul Mantar means the main chant or central belief, and it's found in the Sikh scripture, the Sri Guru Granth Sahib. It speaks of God as one, a permanent truth without fear or hate. As a broad philosophical perspective, Taoism speaks of the Tao, the Way, which refers to an unknowable, unnameable, inexhaustible reality that precedes, gives rise to, and governs, in an impersonal manner, all existence. Some forms of Taoism envision the existence of gods and spirits, each governing different parts of the world. Aside from systems of belief, we might also say that religions tend to include codes of character and conduct, providing a picture of what type of people we should be and how we should act. Hinduism emphasizes characteristics and practices such as ahimsa, nonviolence, satya, or truthfulness, and asteya, or refraining from stealing. There are five precepts encouraged among Buddhist followers. Refraining from killing living things. Refraining from stealing. Not misusing your senses, especially in a sexual way. Not engaging in falsehood and not using substances that intoxicate you. The Mosaic Law in Judaism has the famous Ten Commandments, but according to rabbis, it actually has 613 mitzvah, or commandments. These include laws against stealing, harming the poor, lying, and murder. Much of the ethics of Christianity were inherited from Judaism because it started off as a branch of Judaism. Jesus was Jewish. Like other rabbis before him, Jesus summed up the Mosaic Law with two central commandments. Love the Lord your God with everything you have and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus also had a version of the Golden Rule. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Islam has five pillars, or central practices. One of them is zakat, or giving to those in need. So charity, or we might even say justice, is a central requirement in Islam. Zoroastrianism teaches that in order to align ourselves with the good, we should have three central aims. Good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. One example of a good deed is charity, giving to those in need. Confucianism has a key emphasis on zhen, which can be translated as love or goodness. Confucianism also has a version of the golden rule. Do not do to others as you would not have them do to you. Jainism emphasizes the principle of ahimsa, nonviolence, toward all living creatures. Jains tend to be vegetarian. One of the central duties of Sikhism is giving, sharing your wealth with those in need. There's also an emphasis on avoiding prejudice. Doing these things helps protect the followers of Sikhism against self-centeredness. Taoism emphasizes the importance of going with the flow in order to achieve harmony with the Tao. To do this, it's good to live simply, to develop patience, and to practice compassion. We might also say that religions tend to include rituals and ceremonies, practices that followers can participate in in order to help facilitate relationships with one another, with the world around them, and even with spirits and the divine. These can include particular rites, special practices, and the celebration of holy days. There are specific funeral rites in Hinduism, some of which are performed at specific times after the death of the person. One of these is the Shraddha, performed 10 days after death, which honors a dead ancestor. A common practice in Buddhism is a pilgrimage to a particular shrine or temple. These pilgrimages can either build merit for the participant or purify their body. Jewish rituals can include things like circumcision, don't Google that, and holy days such as Passover and Yom Kippur. Many Christians are baptized as infants or when they get older. They also participate in a common meal called the Lord's Supper or Eucharist or Communion. Muslims who are physically able will fast during the daylight hours for the entire month of Ramadan. Similar to a requirement in Islam, Zoroastrians will pray five times a day. There are also specific purification rituals, including baths. Jainism can include the veneration of images of people who have achieved moksha, that is, liberation from the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. There's also the celebration of parvan, or holy days. Purity is extremely important in Shintoism, so there's an emphasis on bathing rituals to maintain purity. Entry into Sikhism is accompanied by the Armit ceremony, a ritual of initiation which includes something akin to baptism. It also begins the path of the five Ks, which includes kesh, keeping one's hair long, uncut, but kept in a turban. So seriously, stop calling people who are wearing turbans Muslim. Get some knowledge, yo. Taoism can include rituals of purification, including setting the chi of one's body or space right through breathing, meditation, or organization. 
Again, it's important to remember, even though we can find these common dimensions of beliefs, ethics, and rituals in all these different religions, we're not saying that this is the absolute definition of religion. We're just saying that this is how the word functions in our cultural context. It's a way that we can talk about religions, even though we know we're not absolutely getting it right. In this video, we talked about the difficulty of defining religions. We explored a bit of language theory. Man, was that a good time. Woo! looked at different definitions of religion, and suggested a way of thinking about religion in terms of how the word functions in our cultural context. I hope you found this video helpful. Until next time!